Hey, today we're going to be talking about how sales has changed and how do you go about creating uh, a segment, a niche for yourself and probably one of the most crowded spaces there are out there. And how do you edge out your competition when you're just a startup? That's what we're going to talk about today with my friend Paul from Anaplan. Anaplan is one of the hottest companies out there, and they kind of came out of nowhere. And in business intelligence, uh, that market has existed forever, and it's been dominated by huge players. So how as a startup do you find the right team, uh, reward them in the right way, and in keep them focused on the right things. Let's get into it. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode and I'll sum it up at the end. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, Brian, thank you. Uh, I've been here um, at Anaplan a little over two years, uh, but spent pretty much the last 30 plus years in enterprise software. Uh, starting out in Philadelphia, I was um, uh, right out of college at ADP, which was a great training ground for salespeople. And back in 1983, they actually used to invest in, in a lot of sales training back then. And ADP was a great uh, first company to work for. And then uh, I was pretty lucky. And I always say in sales, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, <laughs> I was living in Philly and there was a small German company called Systems Application and Products and Data Processing that had about 50 people in Philadelphia. And um, I was one of the first employees. And obviously that company was SAP or now SAP. So it was spent a good part of my career there through the uh, startup, through growth phases. And so it was a pretty interesting uh, opportunity to, to, you know, work with some of the world's largest companies on these big reengineering pro- processes through the 90s. And then um, took a big risk, moved out here to the Valley in 1998, pre-revenue at a company called Ariba, a business-to-business e-commerce firm, and um, spent probably about 15 years uh, on and off there. Uh, until we sold it to SAP in um, in 2012, did some private equity work at a company called iPipeline, uh, insurance software company, and then uh, ended up back here in the Valley, second tour of duty, moved back out here two years ago for Anaplane. Nice. And I, that must have been a big contrast between ADP and SAP. Yeah, I'll tell you, <laughs> ADP was great. I remember my early sales days, I had North Philly territory, which is a pretty rough neighborhood. And, um, you know, there were a couple of times where I came out of the appointment and I didn't have a car. So, <laughs> you know, going from that, uh, selling to small and light manufacturing companies and, and small service companies in, in the inner city to uh, selling to Fortune 5 companies was uh, definitely a contrast, that's for sure. And t- tell us the Anaplan story. You know, what, uh, what was your motivation for going there? When you showed up, what did it look like? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting story. I mean, I, I kind of thought I was, you know, going to kind of hang it up after all these years in enterprise software. And then I got a call from, you know, my former boss who was on the board here. And he says, hey, I want you to take a look at this company, Anaplan. And, and I had never heard of it, honestly. And being in technology, I probably should have. But the more I looked under the covers, Brian, it, it, it just became pretty evident that there was something special going on here. So I came out, you know, interviewed and just felt an amazing buzz at the company uh, you know, just a real high IQ, a lot of young talent uh, and a lot of energy. And I was like, what is going on here that is so different? And then I realized pretty quickly the disruptive nature of Anaplan. I mean, it is a analytics and planning platform. And I think it's different in other platforms with millions of these different point solutions for analytics and, and planning. Uh, but it's a connected platform. And they're the two things that differentiate it from really the dozens of other companies that that are in this space. And what's unique about it is, you know, when the founder, Michael Gould, started the company actually in a barn outside of London, a place called York. So it's got a great, you know, beginning. Uh, He had worked at a company called the Datum, which was bought by Cognos, which was bought by IBM. At the same time that was happening, companies like OutlookSoft and Business Objects were bought by SAP, Arborsoft, buying Hyperion, bought by Oracle. So in 2007 or so, 2008, all innovation in our space basically stopped when the big three did those major acquisitions. And Michael went to the folks at IBM and said, hey, I can build a connected planning and analytics platform. I can make it scalable. I can build it in memory. I can put it in the cloud. I can make it business friendly. All these amazing things. And of course, IBM said, no, we're just going to 
put a new user interface on the thing. <laughs> That's you know, what they're doing. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the wine. You know, when I, I was at college, we used to put the cheap wine into the into the fancy bottles. That's kind of what these guys do. Right? So, uh, so luckily, Michael got off on his own, spent three years literally in the barn building the engine, and then came out here, of course, couldn't get money in, in London or in Europe, came out here to Silicon Valley, uh, raised some money, and the rest is really history. And what did the sales organization look like when you showed up? Yeah, you know, uh, I got here, you know, we had you know, kind of, it wasn't really a startup. It was kind of a tweener, which is, you know, kind of a good situation for me, right? I think, yeah. you know, my many years in sales and sales experience, my goal is to get something that's already kind of baked, but needs to get to the next level and, and you know, pour the gasoline on it. And so that's really what it looked like here. We had a, a good core group of, uh, of sales folks. The profile was a little different. We had hired a lot of uh, people from the enterprise performance management space, um, which uh, really was a little different profile than what we do here at Anaplan. So those folks primarily worked at the big three company. Uh, they had experience in financial planning, but they really didn't understand what Anaplan was as a platform across the enterprise. So what we're unique about, Brian, is that we not only sell to the finance folks or the office of CFO, uh, but we're selling to the office of the CRO, we're selling to the head of marketing, we're selling to the head of manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, because planning is really across an enterprise. So if you think about here in the Valley, you know, most of the large technology firms with, you know, 20, 30,000 sales reps use Anaplan to deal with all of their account segmentation, their territory, quota management, incentive comp, all that stuff was done primarily even at the world's largest companies, HP, Cisco, Adobe, VMware, on spreadsheets. And you know sales today, it's, it was maybe an art when I started selling back in the 80s, but it is absolutely a science today. And if you don't know what you're paying your people, you don't know what accounts they're running with, you have unbalanced territories, uh, you know, you're going to be in a, in a really tough uh, situation from a sales productivity perspective. And if you look at some of the results some of our customers are having with the impact on sales productivity – uh, by putting Anaplan on the front end of the business, amazing. And then if you kind of walk through your house, you go through your pantry, you go in your garage, uh, you go in your wife's closet, uh, you know, I can assure you that most of the products, the goods, the services that, you know, uh, most of the consumer product goods and retail companies, uh, cosmetic companies, uh, all using Anaplan to run their supply chain. And then, of course, the traditional finance component of it. So, Bringing in salespeople that just know how to sell to the finance person was a big shift for us. And so people who really knew how to navigate across an enterprise uh, became the profile of the reps we have now. So it sounds like it was a lot more like SAP than it was uh, ADP. <laughs> yes. You know, and, you know, our client base is varied. I mean, our product could go into small, mid-sized firms. Yeah. However, the majority of our customers tend to be Fortune Enterprises. The more complex... Uh, the larger the scale, uh, that's really where Anaplan differentiates itself from these literally, you know, other platforms that have been around 20, 25 years. So it sounds like it's a very complex sale. Is that true? Yeah, it is difficult because you think about trying to navigate a Fortune 50 organization. First of all, they don't even know what they're doing yeah. within a lot of different silos of the business, the different regions. A lot of times they'll come to our account reps and try to find out what's going on in their own companies. So, yes, it is complex selling to large enterprises. And, um, you know, that's why we have the type of profile uh, of account rep that we have that, you know, has a very high IQ, very independent. Uh, you know, don't take no for an answer because if you go into finance, they're not ready to buy it. You can go to supply chain, you can go to sales, you go to marketing, go in the IT group. Uh, the beauty is our product. Planning is everywhere in an organization, and almost everyone has an opportunity to use our platform. And so where do the reps typically start? You know, let's say into a cold account. They, they get the territory. Mm -hmm. They've got little to no mm -hmm. leads probably. Or, you know, you know what it's like. You know, the big yeah, quota. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marketing guys never give us the leads, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could go to trade shows, and, it's, you know, it's hard to understand, like, a company like yours exactly what does it do. Mm -hmm. And, right. and under a minute, it's really hard. It really is. And I think, you know, you think about the different personas that we sell to. So 
if I'm talking to the CRO of a you know large company with 20,000 reps, it's pretty easy to talk to them about how they're managing territories, quotas, incentive compensation plans, sales productivity, sales forecasting, things that are very close to their uh, domain. But then if you talk to somebody in finance or in supply chain about that, they have no idea what you're talking about. So the beauty is at the very highest level of the organization, whether it's the CIO or the CFO, uh, they get the concept of how these things are so disparate in their current organization and how it's disconnected. And the amazing thing is, I call them boundary systems, but the world today, all the money that's been spent on ERP and you know CRM systems and HCM systems, billions, trillions of dollars, the reality is these are transaction-based systems. The true decision-making in organizations are done based upon information coming off of PowerPoint slides derived from models built in Excel. Yes. Or point solutions. So, and that is not unique to any company. It, it Every is, Fortune is. company has this exact same problem, which would really would attract me to Anaplan is I wouldn't have got excited about replacing Oracle Hyperion or IBM's, you know, TM1 product. That That's not something that would have brought me back to California. But the fact that I can replace boundary systems, literally hundreds of them, thousands of them in these Fortune companies that are point solutions in supply chain or sales, or marketing or in finance uh, with a platform like Anaplan is truly revolutionary and incredibly disruptive. Well, that's it. And I, I don't think a lot of people really understand that today because, you know, I work you know, through an acquisition at a, you know, one of the largest companies and they had all of this crap, I mean, stuff, <laughs> enterprise software. And, it, you know, and all of a sudden every Monday they, they mailed out the, the forecast and a spreadsheet, you know. <laughs> You, you know the problem, Brian. Right. And, and all of a sudden, you know, and, you know, everyone said, oh, it was based off the CRM. It had nothing to do with the CRM. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was just this roll up of, you know, spreadsheets. And, oh, what a nightmare. And could you imagine running a fortune company today? Uh, it's kind of like driving a car, right? You're, you're trying to drive the car. And, you know, a lot of the BI tools and the, the, the things that have helped you know, the Tableaus are great products. Uh, in fact, a great customer of ours, and we use their product. It, it's, it's good at looking at what happened, yeah. right? So you can yeah. look in the rearview mirror. You know, hopefully it's not foggy anymore so you can see what happened behind you. The problem is you have to drive the car so much faster today, and you need to know what's coming ahead, especially in today's world. I mean, you know, you look at companies like Amazon, you know, the, the industries that they're coming into. If, if you're sitting back waiting for something to happen, you know, winter's coming. In fact, it's almost here. So these companies need to react much quicker. The macroeconomics environment, you know, is, is ever changing. So the fact that you can run these companies on series of disparate spreadsheets, those days are going to be over or you're going to wind up not being in the Fortune 500 anymore. There's a lot of those companies that are no longer in the Fortune 500. So it sounds like when you, when you showed up, you, you needed to hone the, the profile of, you know, the A player candidates for the reps. And those are pretty, sounds like pretty much the classic enterprise software people. You know, Brian, that's what I thought, honestly, when I first got in here. And some of those folks honestly have lost their fastball. So they just couldn't adjust to this kind of a faster paced environment. Yeah. Because if you're sitting at an SAP or an Oracle or an IBM, it really is almost a professional visitor job in some of those accounts. They <laughs> have ELAs in place. They literally are just, you know, uh, supporting an existing infrastructure that's sitting there. And then what happened is all these cloud providers over the past 10 years, and obviously led by uh, Mark and Salesforce, you know, have come in through the side doors. And now the CIOs have literally a plethora of challenges to pull all this Humpty Dumpty back together. And, you know, you would think that the traditional enterprise software guy like myself would be the perfect profile. And some of them are, don't get me wrong. Uh, but we found that a lot of the kind of folks that come out of pre-sales or consulting yeah. Yeah. Uh, have, you know, who have a good stage presence and, and, you know, you can almost teach them some of the basic selling skills. Uh, but they truly understand business. They understand business processes. They understand business processes across an enterprise. And they truly can become a trusted advisor in these large enterprises. And that seems to be a profile that is maybe unlike the traditional enterprise 
you know, software, you know, person that I hired at SAP back in the 90s. Well, you know, I've consistently, and that, that's my background, and that's how I got into sales. And I've seen that repeat itself because, I, you know, we, where you found things that were baked, I found things that weren't even in the oven yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And we were trying to put it together while the oven's open and, and get it cooked. Um, now, how about as far as the, the sale being very technical, meaning like you, you must have to connect to a bunch of stuff? Yeah, I mean, the technical aspect of the sale is actually the easy part because um, – there's ELT tools today, like Informatica, MuleSoft, Snap, all these, you know, very sophisticated, you know, warehouse capabilities to get data back and forth from different places, right? Because I just mentioned over the past 10 years, they had these legacy infrastructure systems from SAP and Oracle, and then all these cloud systems came in because those systems weren't able to address all the needs of the business. All that stuff went out, um, you know. Uh, to try to tie this all together. So then the ELT tools like MuleSoft and other became much more prevalent in these companies. So I think tying the data together is, is it's always a challenge, but I think that's less uh, part of the sale as the fact that you're really transforming the way these guys are doing the business, whether it's a new way of budgeting, like zero-based budgeting, a completely different approach to budgeting, rolling forecasts, things that are different in the way the business process works, right? So, you know, the sales and operations plan at, at a CPG company that traditionally has been bifurcated into multiple legacy systems now can be integrated into one planning engine on Anaplan. That really changes the role and responsibility of the workers, of the process, all the way through, whether it's sales, supply chain, or finance. So there's huge transformational aspects of our platform so it's not really just the technical integration piece. It's more the new business process, the change management. And that, that's why, obviously, companies like Bain, McKinsey, BCG, Deloitte, Accenture like working with Anaplan, not because you have to screw a lot of software in and, and connect a bunch of pipes and data, but truly there's change management, business process reengineering uh, and transformation that's occurring you know, whether it's a finance transformation, a supply chain transformation, a whole go to market transformation, all these are being enabled by our technology. So that's really the, the, the thing that, that sells it, not so much the technology itself. OK. And when you showed up, where were deals getting stuck versus where are they getting stuck today? Or, you know, what, what I'm kind of trying to get at is, you know, given your experience, what were they not doing before you showed up? Yeah, I, I think it's not what they weren't doing. I think when you start realizing what it takes to uh, work with global companies and the level of expectation that they have uh, from companies like Anaplan, right? And I think that's where the startup to the, you know, I don't know if you have teenage children, but like the tweeners and then to be a real company. So a lot of companies are startups. They never get to where we're at. And then a lot of companies where we're at never get to be the next Salesforce or Workday or ServiceNow because they don't make that transition to really get to these global companies and, and truly get into these companies and expand and become a critical component of their daily operations. And I think, you know, a lot of companies sell point solutions. That's great. You know, we have a land and expand strategy. We get into a certain area. But the key is once you're in a large global company? How do you expand into other business units, other regions, uh, other divisions, other lines of business? If you're successful in doing that, now you become a critical fabric of the decision making of that global company. And that's when the deals start to accelerate and now, get much bigger. And that's what I see a lot of these high velocity companies not doing, that they're so transactional oriented you know, that it then goes over to the customer success team and then the rep goes to find the, you know, the next thing to shoot. And, and I think that that skill that you described is kind of um, uh, almost extinct, you know, yeah. because of the new SaaS model. Yeah, the SaaS model, you're exactly right on there, Brian. SaaS models caused a lot of challenges in that if you think back in the old days, you sold a big, giant, perpetual deal they're committed. They just spend 10, 20, $100 million with the consulting firm. And then that sales rep is gone and there's no really need for that person to come back. Where with the SaaS model, even though our average, you know, 10 years, two plus years, almost three years, which is fantastic. The average SaaS deal is usually a year or less, right? So 
you really have to, once you're in, your selling never stops. And so a lot of times, a lot of companies are transaction oriented. The sales reps come in, the hunters come in, and then there's not a smooth transition to the farmer. Uh, and that's where a lot of companies fall apart. Our model's critical for customer success because we're coming into a division, we land in a certain area, but as I mentioned, our stuff is connected across the enterprise. If we're gonna get and spread across the enterprise, we have to be successful, obviously in that initial delivery, but more so in expanding and getting the adoption of the technology across multiple lines of business, that's when it becomes successful. And you're right, a lot of companies aren't geared to deal with the complexities of large companies and or they don't have the resources or the skill sets uh, to be able to service the demands of the fortune companies. And describe you know, what that organization looks like because that is not what a lot of people are used to. You know, do you have, um, you know, because what, let's say somebody closes, you know, a nice big account, you know, Fortune mm -hmm. 50 account. Mm -hmm. How do you keep that rep incentivized, focused, and not distracted by the next shiny object? Yeah, so the, the nice thing about what we do, Brian, that next shiny object's already in front of you, yeah. right? So if you so you think about the hardest thing to sell in a Fortune company is to get through InfoSec, IT, and worst of all, procurement. Right. So you think about these large companies, they want less suppliers. They don't want a well, uh, you know, hundred new cloud suppliers at 500,000 a piece. They want a less suppliers makes their life and job easier. Getting through the security now, the cloud security at some of these fortune companies, it's literally, uh, I always say our, our time to get through security and procurement is usually twice the time that it takes to implement the stuff. So it's just, that's the reality. So once you're in as a rep, you now have a license to hunt within a fortune company. So you might land at a 50 to 100 to $150,000 transaction in a large company in a very small segment or line of business. Now your incentive is to, now that you've been through procurement, you've been through InfoSec, you've been through IT, you know, all those challenging things to become a new supplier. Now you hunt within that large enterprise. You literally can, you know, make your entire quota from one or two accounts. And what do you see people doing wrong today? You know, because I'm sure you're in the Valley, you talk to a mm -hmm. lot of, um, you know, counterparts that are, you know, in, you know, high velocity companies that, you know, have a window of opportunity. What mistakes do you see people making? Yeah. And, and I would say we all make the same mistakes, right? It's, it's, you look at the short term yeah. at the shiny object, uh, at the next quarter, you know, we need to do the next fundraising round. I, I really think that the challenge here, and it's always been this way, and nothing's changed in the 25 years since I've been here, is a lot of people take a very short-term view uh, of the business. And that's that's a problem, right? It's a problem when you're dealing with customers, because if you really think about you know, our whole approach at Anaplan is customer first, right? You think about the software companies that are out there today, especially the large ones, they're like the anti-customer first. When 45% of your revenue is done through audit and extortion, it's a really <laughs> tough um, way to be customer friendly. So we want to be opposite that. We want to you know, partake in our, our customer success. We want a value-based approach where the customer is getting value from our platform. I mean, these are things that are long-term. That's why customers stay with you for years and continue to buy more. And that's the approach we want to take. And I think that's very different than the mentality. And not all companies. There's some phenomenal examples of customer first companies. Uh, but I, I think for the most part, a lot of young companies fall into the quarterly trap or the next round of funding trap and, and they lose sight of the long-term picture. And unfortunately they lose sight of the most important thing. And that's who's paying our bills and that's the customer. And where do you see sales going say in the next five years? Sales as a profession or yeah, yeah. revenue sales? Yes. I, mean, I, can't, I can't answer those questions. Uh, my CFO will kill me. Uh, <laughs> I know you're very focused on revenue. Yeah, yeah that's right. But I think, you know, not on a plan specific, but I think the selling profession uh, is dramatically changing. And it's been changing, but it's it's getting more, you know, I, I always use the word art and science. I mean, back pre-cell phones and, you know, uh, pre-technology, uh, art was pretty much the, the, the way sales was done. It was a relationship uh, profession. And not to say that the relationship isn't still important because I think people still always buy from people, but there's so much science, so much AI, so much things that you can put into the selling motion 
in a company today to make it more efficient. And then you can start to, to fine tune those knobs, if you will, whether it's around compensation or territory or quota or, or the way you forecast or the way you go to market. I mean, these things are no longer gut feels or based on my experience. There's just so much data and science and, and best practices that you can start to leverage. And I think the companies that kind of just do it the way they've always done it uh, are going to struggle. Right. I mean, you know, think about the profile we talked about earlier, Brian. You know, I, I came in. The profile was what you would think the profile would be. And we were struggling. Right. So we took a chance on a probably a very different profile that has been incredibly successful for us. Right. So I think you got to be willing to experiment, to try new things, to use data, be data driven around what you do and, and think of what we do as a science and, and run it as an efficient operation. You know, and at the end of the day, it's still, you know, face to face and and relationships and all those things, you know, don't go away. But I think you just can't rely on just that anymore going forward. Great. Hey, for the, the executives that are listening that feel that at a plan is a, a match for them, where should they go? They should just call me direct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cut cut out those reps. Huh? <laughs> House accounts. I got to commission myself. Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas is coming up, right? There you go. It is Christmas time. Now, I think that, you know, for folks that are thinking about Anaplan, I mean, first of all, visit the website and look at the app exchange or we, we call it uh, our app hub. Uh, similar to like what Salesforce has as an app exchange, it, it shows you the breadth of our ecosystem and the type of things we're doing. So if you look at that, I think there's over 200 and some odd now that either we have built, our customers have built, our partners have built. It's just unbelievable. And then you also can look uh, at the stories that our customers tell. You know, we, we compete with some of the big three or four. They, they don't want to give their customer references because they don't have any. Right. And everybody's throwing this stuff out. Um, you know, you go on our website, you see all these people like almost a cult feeling talking about how their operation has changed, how their life has changed, how their profession has changed because of this tool set and this platform has dramatically changed the way people operate. Those stories are just phenomenal stories. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. We're not saving the world or anything, but when we take uh, this platform and put it into these large organizations and take people from their mundane tasks of entering data into a spreadsheet to becoming true business analysts and helping to make the most critical decisions in a large company, that's jackpot. That, that's the kind of stories you'll see on the website. I'm so glad to talk to sales leaders who really get it. The ones that aren't trying to save money on commission, but more on how to grow a business, how to capture great accounts, how to reward great salespeople, recruit them, motivate them, lead them. I'm really got this thing recently about sales management. Everyone talks about management. And I hear these people uh, talk about getting rid of commission. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> everybody's moving all to this activity and it just kills me because it's not the activity. Yes, you have to show up. Yes, you have to do the right thing. Yes, you have to make phone calls and emails and network, but it all comes down to is how well you do it. It's this level of insanity that has really taken and hijacked our profession and turned it over to the operations and the accountants. And guess what? It works if there's pull. If you've got a great product and the market is there and then you're at the right time, fantastic. <laughs> but most of us aren't. Most of us are trying to find our market, trying to create our market, trying to dominate our market, trying to get into new accounts, trying to close large complex sales. And guess what? <laughs> it's work. It's hard work. It's creative work. And we're not going to do it by sitting around counting dials and bathroom breaks. It just doesn't work that way. So it's great to hear a sales leader talk about that. And, and if you're interested in getting better at your game, the game of sales, go to b2brevenue.com. I've got two main courses there. Start the conversation, get the meeting. This will show you exactly how to get into key accounts, any account you want, how to look at your territory, prioritize it, spend your time wisely, and then get in and start conversations the way people want to. If you heard my recent episode, I'm really getting into the psychology of it. I'm going to start calling it M to M, mammal to mammal 
selling. Get away from, you're not selling to a company, yes, but the company's full of mammals. And to call them human is to distract you from who they really are and who you have to talk to. We've got to talk to the mammal. We got to. We got to connect with the mammal. And then we work up to the human and the business needs. And then the mammal is not a pejorative. It's fact. You can argue it all you want, but we're not talking in the right way. We're approaching in the wrong way, and their mammals are fighting us off because that's what mammals do. And it's not wrong. It just is. And I show you how to get around that step by step and come up with a system. Yes, you still have to do something. Sorry. Brian, where's the button? Hit the button. Where's the revenue going to my bank? There's a little bit more into it than that. Yes, you got to do a little bit of work, but wouldn't it be nice to understand what works, why what everyone else is doing isn't working, and how to come up with a system that's repeatable, predictable, and scalable? Unlike, ah, who is responsible for buying my crap? Nobody. That's who. The other part is closing the complex sale. And I hear this from managers all the time. They don't understand how companies buy. It's check in, push, give a discount. Uh, That incentivizes them to buy, but it doesn't teach them how to get things done at their company. And that's what this course is about. I spent 25 years at more companies than I care to remember closing complex sales. And Luckily, I learned it early in my career. How? Because I was working with people that had been doing it for 30 years. And even though they couldn't tell me, they showed me by example. It wasn't that they didn't know. They just couldn't articulate it. And I was like, I'm not going to waste my time. And that's really, it was out of, I wouldn't say laziness because I was working 80 hours a week. It was just, I hate wasting my time. So I mapped out how companies buy because it certainly wasn't my delightful personality, as you can tell. It was, I guided them through a process. They don't know what the decision-making process is. What's your decision-making process? What are you going to have for dinner tonight? I don't know. Whatever's in the fridge. That's, people don't know. They they take step by step. Our job is to guide them through that process. But we can't do that unless we know what it is. And we got to prevent it from getting stuck. Why? Because trying to unstuck it is too hard. So go to b2brevenue.com. Schedule a time to talk it over with me. See if it's a match. Listen to the podcast. Listen to at least three to kind of self-qualify. Because I don't want you in the course if it's not a match. And I'll tell you that. I want to help you. It includes three major elements. The content, you get access to it day one. Two, you get office hours, Q&A, group meetups. Three, unlimited one-on-one it's with me. We get on Zoom, we talk over a deal, and apply the course to the deal. And my motivation is to help you crush your number. So if you want to double your income, sign up. If you don't, that's cool. I understand. The world needs B players, too. Plenty of room, at least in this economy. Wait till the recession comes. Whoa, don't threaten me with a recession, Brian. That's not nice. Hey, if you have sales questions, go to the Sales Questions Brutally Honest Answers podcast. Check out the B2B Revenue Leadership Show as well. I've got a YouTube channel, Brian Burns Sales on YouTube, or just search Maverick Method, all one word. And follow me on LinkedIn. We also have a company page on LinkedIn, the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast company page. Check that out. Funny videos, informative announcements, all kinds of things. I I try and keep it light. There's just, uh, otherwise we cry. (laughs) Sales is hard. But if, if you really learn it, it can become fun. It becomes like a puzzle. There we go. A puzzle.